Hey guys. Salut, hey. salut. Hi, hello. You're good yourself. Morning. Yeah, like it's almost good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Oh yeah, you were. You're in the UK right now. Yeah, it's almost eleven. Wow. Yeah, it's late here for me. It's well early. I don't know, six o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. Yeah. Not that I, late, but like not, not the hours people usually do things online. Yeah, and Jeff is I think before almost six, six in the morning. Oh wow. Where are you, Jeff? I'm in Taipei. Oh. Is that where you, is that where you're yeah, normally based out of? Yeah, yeah. I'm with been out of Taipei for a while. Hmm. Oh, Jeff's frozen. Oh, we lost Hadrian. I think Hadrian is in France. I wonder where Vitalik is. Like, I thought he's doing somewhere in Asia, but he was in like a Gitcoin live view just like four hours ago. So I'm not sure if he's in Europe or he just doesn't sleep much. Hey Nick. Are you still based in Lyon, Hadrian? Yeah, I'm getting some issues with the audio, but I'd have to go with those headphones. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like about 14 people said they're going to attend. So wait like probably five minutes and then. During that time, like we just do like quick introduction. Probably like currently, pretty. I think we kind of know each other, but yeah, we'll wait like five minutes, and after that, we'll start. Hey Shane. Hey guys. Hey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so. Just you don't have to go on a lot. Just like name, organization, and the probably like you are either you doing wallet or layer two or something else so you could just say i love them so i'm makoto and i work at ens so now them so yeah that actually that yeah uh rick richard hello uh hi my name is richard um i work with ethers js and firefly which is like a hardware wallet and we want to incorporate some layer two stuff into that as well um, <coughs> I have lots of random projects, but yeah, layer two is awesome. So that's me. Cool. Jeff? Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff. I work at ENS, um, mainly on the DAP side and JavaScript side. Adrian? Hey, I'm Adrian. I work for iExec and I do a lot of uh, random stuff on the community. Hey, uh, Shane? I'm Shane with Ethereum, Wear Wallet, um, trying to figure out, navigate the layer two landscape right now. Cool. Uh, I'll skip Nick because, because you know, he's going to talk plenty. Uh, Harry. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm Harry. I'm uh, from Offchain Labs, uh, developing a uh, EVM uh, supporting general uh, purpose rollup. Cool. Nice to meet you. And... Uh, Zach. Hi everyone, um, I'm Zach. Uh, I work for Aztec and we are developing a ZK rollup based um, layer two um, solution with uh, privacy built in as a first class limiter. Cool. So I, we're just waiting basically Vitalik. Uh, are there anyone else who hasn't been introduced? I'm Chris. Uh, also working on Ethereum, and we're also exploring the Layer 2 space and work with, uh, we give all of our users ENS names. Cool. Uh, just wondering, like, we are thinking about doing, 
was wondering whether we should explain how ENS work in general, but uh, everybody pretty much uh, know like how, like a, if I say resolver, registrar, registry, do most people understand? Okay. Uh, okay, so I think Nick, uh, we might be able to just skip the register, the architecture uh, explanation completely. Yeah. People. Yeah, that's fine with me. If, if everyone's familiar with ENS's basic infrastructure, then uh, we can skip that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I did. We don't just forget. Oh, is it, it's still two out two minutes left. He did reply, and he did accept. So we just wait a couple more minutes, and uh, I think once we hit five past, uh, we are quite ahead of the schedule. <laughs> we did the introduction. We skipping the NS overview, so we could just yeah. After we wait like a few minutes, uh, I think Nick, Nick, you can just take over. Just let's just wait a couple of minutes. If he, if uh, anyone wants to grab like, you know, coffee or just gonna go to Lou, now is a chance. Were there some optimism folks that were joining? I asked Vitalik to invite some, but. I don't know because they didn't accept. Was there any ZK Sync folks, or is ZK Sync part of Aztec, or, or how no, does that? Uh, I think ZK Sync is Matala, and yeah. uh, he contacted me that he is interested, but he didn't respond since then. I did just pasted invite code, but I'm not sure. Uh, I saw a couple of people joined. Uh, Pete, uh, do you want to just do like five second intro? Hi, uh, my name is Pete. Uh, I'm currently at uh, Coinbase. Um, I uh, was working on my own browser called uh, Adapt that browser called Cipher, uh, and you know that was acquired by Coinbase. Uh, so since then, I, I've been working at Coinbase. I, I built Coinbase Wallet app. And now I'm focused more on uh, USCC and DeFi. Cool. And uh, Joe? Joe? Hey, guys. Sorry I'm a bit late. Um, Zach may have given an intro, but uh, I work with Zach at Aztec. Uh, we're building a private layer, too, uh, for Ethereum. Cool. Uh, I think Harry, did Harry introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did before. Yeah, uh, sorry, from, sorry, yeah. From Arbitrum Labs working on Arbitrum yeah. Rollup. So I think, yeah, you and Aztec uh, are the two guys who is more into layer two, so we are counting on you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, so I think, we, yeah, uh, I think we just like uh, see uh, Vitalik would turn up at some point. If it's not, it's not. Uh, uh, Nick, do you, do you want to take over? Yep. So here today um, is you know we, we've been talking about ENS on layer 2 it came out the workshop and we spent a good time talking about it uh, Vitalik came out with his proposal for it um, I kind of want to set the parameters a bit because um, there's sort of two ways you could look at ENS on layer 2 one is migrating ENS itself to an L2 solution and that's not something we're trying to achieve today um, and the other is making sure that ENS works with L2 so it can resolve L2 addresses and so far as they're different from ETH addresses, um, that L2s can do ENS resolution uh, on chain or off chain. And so that uh, basically we preserve a coherent namespace where somebody can have a reasonable expectation of resolving any name in the ENS ecosystem, even though we want to support, say, uh, names being owned by uh, contracts on L2 and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, reasonably what Vitalik's outline achieves. Um, but of course, it's not the only possible approach. So our goal here today really is to sort of explore the parameter space. Like, what ways can we make sure that ENS is available as a, preferably as a native naming uh, system, but at least as a built-on platform uh, of all the L2s that are, are blossoming? And how can we do that in a way that doesn't require clients that are resolving ENS addresses to be aware of every single L2 individually. 
Um, and, you know, for example, um, Vitalik's proposal avoids that by having uh, bonded attestors for, for each L2 and the resolver, the client doing the resolving doesn't need to know, uh, you know, which L2 it's on, only that somebody who has put up a stake for their honesty said this name resolves to this address or to this text record or whatever other resource there is. Um, so I guess I'd be interested to hear from the people that are here representing L2 solutions, uh, both, first of all, uh, whether you think that's a good idea, and if so, like, you know, that approach is a good idea, and if so, what sort of uh, parameters you'd put around it in terms of, um, uh, you know, of, of structuring it and so forth, and secondly, whether your L2 solution would be able to work with that idea, whether it would be easy to build a bridge between the UNES and your L2 following a scheme like that, and just, you know, any other schemes you've got uh, that, that suit. So uh, I guess who wants to begin? Happy to, to have a first take. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the proposal was, was uh, seemed to, to make a lot of sense and, and line up pretty well, I think, with, uh, with our kind of uh, existing thinking on this. Um, I think, I think uh, you actually already raised kind of the only main concern that we had on the initial take of the proposal, which was kind of how much uh, archival requirements there are on the uh, on the L2 itself to be able to um, evaluate the truthfulness of, of the uh, of the claim. Uh, but it seems as though um, having kind of a, a much shorter term, much shorter period of time. Um, so, you know, for example, two weeks of time as opposed to um, as opposed to an infinite amount of time to to actually prove that a false claim was made um, would be kind of sufficient for, for the spec as is. Um, I think, yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. I think the other, um, most of the issues around kind of the L2 versus L1 interoperability fall, it, it, this is kind of more for optimistic rollups since kind of, since the ZK rollups don't have to bear with the same sort of challenge delays uh, as, and withdrawal delays as we have, um, is that kind of generally in order to make things work nicely, um, you want to have something that looks like monotonicity um, so that there is a value that you know has, there is something that you know has a value and it won't change. Um, and so kind of either going from L1 to L2 or from um, L2 to L1, um, or essentially like if for, if for example, if, if we wanted to do things like have um, the, uh, the other kind of interesting uh, ENS interaction would be the ability of a layer two to actually resolve names using layer one ENS. Uh, but there you run into problems of essentially um, kind of properly reading from there, but that's essentially the other kind of interesting uh, thing to look at. I'm, I'm blathering a little bit, so I'll, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> I, I think uh, you raise an interesting point around dispute periods and so on, because uh, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is the way Vitalik's uh, system was structured. Um, if you disputed something, then the original attester had to prove it true. Um, and they had some window to do that in. Um, and that, uh... Did we just lose Nick? Can anybody else? Yeah, oh, you just cut off. Um, by the way, sorry, um, I, would anybody mind, um, does anyone have a link to the to Vitalik proposal? Because I, I can't, I can't recover. I'm trying yeah, to I, I found you that. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I'm I got, looking Sorry, I got kicked out for a second. Uh, yeah, uh, what happened? Nick, are you back? Yes. Yep, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting the link in the chat. I mean, okay, those are two different ones. But... So I... Uh, I... Uh, so I, I was, what I was trying to say before something went wrong with the connection, um, dispute periods are, are going to be relevant here because it, op optimism based or, you know, optimistic rollup based uh, la layer twos are going to have their own dispute periods, um, which kind of puts a, a timeline on how much we can ask to reach back, as you observed. Um, but it also, I wonder if it has some awkward interactions in terms of um, 
you can't, you know, if you're sending a message from L2 to L1, which might be necessary to prove the resolution of a name, um, that message isn't available until the L2's dispute period is over, um, which means that you need some, uh, you know, some dispute period that's longer than that, but then you also, now you're requiring it potentially to look back further than the L2 expects. So I don't know uh, if anyone who's working on an, an optimistic based rollup has any insights on that. Um, the other thing is deciding whether to structure something like this based on um, uh, uh, challenges requiring the original attester to prove their statement true or whether the challenger has to prove the statement false. And the problem, like Vitalik's initial solution does the former, and the problem with that is that potentially an attester could turn evil and do a substantial amount of, uh, of damage before the period they have to prove their first untrue statement uh, true expires. Whereas if you uh, can prove the attester wrong, then you can potentially shut them down a lot faster. Uh, yeah, I also want to ask you, I, I was a little bit confused about like how resolution is going to work. Like, are we, does that mean basically we don't have a single source of truth? Um, like, are we going to have to, you know, query multiple side chains essentially you know, to be able to, you know, find, uh, to resolve domains? That would, I think, be terrible for user experience and developer experience. Um, yeah, I think explicitly we don't want uh, clients that are doing resolving to have to be aware of every L2. Um, so if you're going, if, if we're going to use something like Vitalik's proposal, there needs to be a network via which a client can contact uh, the attester for a name or an attester for a name and request resolution and get back a signed message without having to care about, you know, what they're actually attesting for, really. Um, and also a way for uh, other attesters to hear about that request and the signed message that was sent back so that they can challenge things, which becomes a data availability thing. And we really don't want to be sending, uh, you know, lodging every resolution request on chain, even as cool data. That's just impractical. One, one kind of um sort of general technique. And I think, you know, when I when I saw Vitalik's proposal, this kind of fit right into to kind of the, the general form that, that we've used before uh, for handling the dispute period um, is that essentially um, a, you know, and, and one way to handle this would be um, every, whenever the, um, whenever the ENS name is, um, is, whenever the ENS record is updated on the layer two um, to send a transaction to the layer one. Um, and essentially then what the attester is doing is essentially just staking on uh, the transaction that they know will be output uh, in a certain block. Since mm -hmm. you have full determinism um, from any sort of outside observer who actually is following the rollup protocol. Um, so there is this delay, but it's only a delay in, in Ethereum being updated, not in, in kind of any meaningful sense of finality. But if so you, if you're, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Are you effectively suggesting that that, that would make ENS uh, name resolution effectively a roll up as well? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's still in the attester model. It's essentially just that the the attester is not is essentially just attesting to that this 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 roll up will will publish essentially Merkle root of updates um, that. It will include this information or put another way essentially kind of the yeah it, kind of more broadly speaking uh, the rollup could publish um periodic updates uh with a merkle root of, of all the main records it contains um and then an attester could just commit that a certain merkle root will be output uh by the rollup in a certain block um, and you won't know about that until the two week until the the challenge period is over um, but any outside observer will be able to know what will happen. Um, yeah, so basically instead of uh, pushing challenge data from L2 to L1 as needed, it's it's all going to be in the roll-up anyway, so you can just generate a proof that that data is there when you need it. And exactly. the, the knows that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So, um, so uh, I'm, I'm familiar with Matic Network just because I'm an advisor uh, for them. But in, in, uh, for Matic Network, it's a proof of stake sidechain um, with uh, plasma characteristics for certain type of, types of tokens. Um, uh, Matic publishes, the validators for Matic publishes uh, a Merc the Merkle root 
on L1 on Ethereum every 30 minutes. So it checkpoints uh, the receipts route and transactions route uh, of L2 onto L1. And with that, you can prove that any transaction has occurred in L2 very easily by creating a Merkle proof. Uh, so that way, like if somebody buys, say, an ENS domain in L2, a medic, you know, after 30 minutes, it will be checkpointed like on L1. So you'll be able to prove very easily without, have to, uh, without having to publish every transaction just by uh, using the Merkle root. You can very easily prove that somebody has purchased um, or any other action. You know, like it could be you know, associating uh, a domain name to an address that could also easily be proven using a Merkle proof. Um, so that could be a model. And um, you know, obviously, it's, uh, it's not related at all to what Vitalik was suggesting. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that different L2s behave differently. And uh, I think the, the strategy is going to look very different. Uh, and uh, he named it a general purpose L2 friendly ENS standard. But I'll, I feel like the, uh, the proposal is very geared towards roll up model. Yes. Well, it certainly, it assumes that, it's a, it assumes a system where you can prove the state of your L2 on your L1, which is fits well with roll-ups, although presumably other constructions will, will have similar requirements just for interoperability. Sorry, uh, could, you, could you repeat what you said? Uh, it assumes a system where you can prove the state of some part of the L2 on the L1, um, which is certainly a good match for roll-ups, but mm -hmm. um, it's like that seems like it would be a requirement for most L2s just on the basis that you know you, you need interoperability. Gotcha. Um, uh, is anyone here working on a non roll up based scalability solution? Okay. Uh, is anyone here who's working on a wallet particular do they do you feel particularly strongly um, about uh, how this would work from the wallet end of things yeah, i'm not from the wallet side but if i may add something here uh, from the beginning we discussed the idea that the ens record can be put on layer two but nick in your initial introduction you also talked about the idea that uh, you could use ENS to resolve address both on layer one and on several layer twos. And I think those are two very different topics. I don't know if you want to discuss the second one. Mm -hmm. You mean using resolving addresses of layer two systems on, on ENS? Yeah, okay. Basically the story is this morning I tried to claim a POAP token and I didn't know it was going to be uh, given on XDAI instead of Ethereum and I gave them my Argent ENS name, and it resolves to my Argent wallet, which doesn't exist on XDAI, and it will never exist there. So I basically got a POAP token awarded on this chain to an address that will never exist there, which is it's a contract that you cannot deploy. And so this is yeah. a very different issue that we're going to have, because when your ENS name resolves to a private key, and this is basically an EVM-based layer two, then there is no issue. You can use the same resolution on both sides. But if you are trying to resolve to a smart contract like Ethereum or Argent or any other smart contract that cannot be deployed uh, at the same address on layer twos, uh, you will have an issue here. So I don't know if the multi-chain support that we have for like Bitcoin, we want to, uh, we want to extend that to, uh, to chain IDs on EVM. Uh, but that's, I think it's another topic. I don't know if you want to discuss it tonight. Well, it's an interesting question. Has I, I don't want to dive into it too deeply because I feel like it's compared to the other problem, it's relatively easy to solve, and that we need need to decide on a way of encoding it and encode it. Um, but I would be curious for anyone here: is anyone here aware of a layer two solution that's applied for a slip forty four coin ID um, as as if it were its own chain, or is everyone is that not been necessary for anyone so far? Um, I know I know optimism for their test net um, took the 420 chain ID um, yeah <laughs> um, I think we're, we're still we're still debating a little bit how to how to handle the chain ID situation because um, our, our general version for optimistic rollups involves kind of having a number of having multiple chains rather than just having kind of a single chain um, yeah. and kind of registering all of them doesn't make the most sense um, our, our current our current method is kind of interesting, um, which is that we derive a chain ID from the address of the uh, L1 rollup contract. 
Um, okay. So that, that though, is an Ethereum chain ID, not a Slip44 chain ID, I assume. Um, not, I, I think so. I, I'm, not, I'm not that well versed in... So Ethereum chain ID is the ones used in the protocol for uh, signing transactions and then the, yeah. uh, the next ID. Um, Slip44 chain IDs are used by uh, multi-coin support for determining what cryptocurrency an address is for. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, so, yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. about EIP-155. Yep. Yeah, I'm curious if anyone's applied for the latter because probably we wouldn't want to encode Ethereum chain ID. Uh, well, yeah, we, we potentially could. Uh, it depends on how we're going to identify these things. It seems clear that some, at least some L2s are going to require their own separate addresses. Um, but yeah, I think this is a this is mostly a standardization conversation that we can probably have uh, as a separate conversation um, because we could spend the hour talking about it, but it is uh, relatively straightforward compared to building an entire optimistic resolution system. So I'd like to explore the unknowns here, if that's all right with everyone. Cool. Um, so uh, where were we talking about? Yeah, so um, it, it seems like a solution, like a, a, a proof-based, you know, a, a proof-based system that uses a testers and bonds and so on is is the best basic structure anyone's come up with. Is any, did anyone come along with an alternative vision of how this could work, or should we just continue pursuing the the parameters of this one? Um, my understanding is the, the tester would only be necessary for optimistic rollups, is that right? Um, it would strictly only be necessary for things where you can't synchronously prove the contents of a, of a resolution, you know, without a bond. Um, but I, the idea would be that you would have a testers for everything simply because your client, your resolver, doesn't want to have to care about each individual network and be able to verify it independently. So in some cases, these attestors will be risk-free. They're like, I will attest that the, you know, the result of verifying this BLS signature is this because you know, there's no risk to me in doing so. Um, and I will get paid some trivial amount for doing it. Um, but it, it makes a simpler structure if you simply say, this is how all of them work. And then do you know like, a pro or like what order of magnitude that uh, bond would be? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, it would need to be substantial enough that a lying attester couldn't profit by, you know, by, by doing that. And that's how large, large that is depends on, of course, um, the value they could extract, which comes down to, you know, how much could you fish off somebody, which also comes down to how much are people using ENS and what are they using it for. So it's a very difficult question to answer. One possible way to do this would be to allow clients to parameterize, I will only accept attestations from an attester with a bond of at least X, and then we can see what evolves. Um, the other big question there is how attestors actually get incentivized and paid for, for staking their tokens. Um, because, you know, you can't, unless we stick to a particular L2 for micropayments or something, and then pay them all for the, each resolution, it's unclear how they how they profit directly from that. It's a quick question with this Atesta network stuff. Do we, a couple questions. First point is like, do we need this kind of bonding network or uh, the connection between the East one and the specific layer two? So for example, if it's like a, for the uh, optimism, we need one bonding network, and if for the ZK sync, we need another, and that they are kind of completely separated network. That's the first question. And the, uh, this is related to something I actually asked Vitalik just five hours ago when he was online. That I asked that, like, you know, is this something very unique to ENS? So like uh, if some DAP wants to, completely different DAP wants to, you know, take on similar approach, do they have to build this kind of test network? network from scratch and then Vitalik's answer was that this could be something generic so that like each DAP shouldn't really have to build but maybe th there's a, some difference of thinking on your side because it, it, this what I hear is like you what you are proposing is very kind of just focus on ENS. Um, 
I did. I guess the uh, one of the parameter, one of the things I wanted to explore was whether there are existing uh, networks that we, or you know, architectures or libraries we could use for this. Um, the problem I think is that this is a subject that things like optimistic rollups have been very carefully sidestepping by using uh, Ethereum as their data availability solution because. We need an, for this to work. We'd need a network with some difficult properties. It needs to be censorship resistant. Um, it needs to be uh, you know easy to, to connect to and and um, and synchronize with in a you know even under the assumption of poor network connectivity and and malicious nodes. Um, and it needs to be scalable in the sense that we can't simply broadcast every resolution request to every single node on the network. Um, you, so you need, in a nutshell, you need to be able to connect to this easily as a client, uh, send out a resolution request, know that it was received by at least n attesters, um, so that you know the, the uh, oh sorry, know that it's received by at least one attester who's prepared to answer you, and then know that their response to you was also seen by a bunch of, of potential challengers, um, and that's quite a difficult set of properties to, to have in a potentially hostile situation because we really don't want to end up in a situation where um, an attester can simply ensure that the, the resolving client is the only one who ever gets the message and since they don't know enough about the network being done they're not in a position to challenge the invalid signature and so they can get away with sending invalid messages for an arbitrary amount of time. Um, I mean one potential way to handle things like this is the potential challengers can simply make fake resolution requests. Uh, they can even spy on the actual resolution requests and, and duplicate them and see if anyone sends them invalid signatures. So anyone trying to cheat here is playing with fire because they don't know if the resolving client is, is stupid or not. Um, but it's still a very difficult problem and I'm not aware of uh, of communications networks that sold, that have all these properties robustly. Like uh, Ethereum uses a DHT as its base layer, um, which is moderately robust against censorship and moderately robust against, you know, moderately scalable and so forth. Um, but it's it's not ideal, and you know we know Eclipse attacks can happen, and and um, it's difficult to secure the network uh, well against this. So um, and that something ENS uh, team has to kind of not just build but have to maintain because there's no shared aspect. If it's like with like you know multiple organization using the same infrastructure, they could have shared responsibility, but it sounds like it, we have to be the sole kind of people who have to operate and maintain. I mean, ideally it would be peer-based and therefore we're not running infrastructure for it except perhaps discovery nodes but it would need to be, uh, in, in the most part, I think it would need to be specific to ENS, even if it's just a, a deployment of a generic protocol that, you know, this is the instance for ENS and then there are other instances for other protocols. So the development effort could be shared, but probably it would be a separate deployment. But I'm curious whether anyone else on the call has, has experience with networks that meet these requirements and, and if so, what they are. Has anyone been working at that sort of layer much? Uh, I'm broadly familiar with, with Ethereum's uh, gossip layer, but um, only at a high level. Okay, so that's something we're going to have to set as a high research priority, really, is because if that's not viable, then, then the whole system has issues, really. Uh, one thing I want to kind of correct during the meeting is if there is some knowledge gap, we want to explore who should try to reach out and invite for the next one. Or something like this topic, who do you think we should try to reach out and ask for collaboration? It's difficult. I think potentially people who have been working with Plasma would be uh, good contacts because the communications and data availability was a significant issue with uh, with Plasma that, that you know made it very difficult to achieve, and that means they've probably spent a lot of time exploring this this area. About someone like Georgia, you know, he was in that uh, doing some Plasma with the Loom network. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. reach out to him. All right. Uh, 
so I, was wondering, I don't want to take this conversation on too much of a tangent um, because uh, this isn't relating to, to the um, network questions that Nick was bringing up. But I was wondering, do, do, would, you, would, would you mind if I ask a couple of perhaps um, simp simpler questions just to make sure that I'm, because uh, uh, I'm trying to think about this from the perspective of uh, like a non-optimistic layer two, which has some other different challenges um, with synchronizing to, to DNS. Um, yeah. Specifically, um, what 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 I what um so um what would be quite useful for the kind of layers we're thinking about is being able to kind of, is to um kind of trustlessly read from uh, ENS to be like to to, to be able to um, like read out records from from the from from the uh, um, from, from from the ENS by uh, officially in the layer two without having to talk to, let, to layer one. Um, uh, but just I just want to make sure I'm on the right on the same page with everyone here because you're talking about a kind of a different uh, regime where are you are you describing kind of um, a a very DNS where not only can layer two kind of um, read records from from the ENS but also uh, update them and write them, um, and if so, um, is the is it still is it still like uh, is is the architecture just um, what I'm trying to say? Um, like right now, the, the overall state of the of, of the NS is on Ethereum, um, and that's kind of used as the data layer that like, relied on for data availability. Is that still going to be the case moving forward, or are you, are you planning on kind of a more general network where the, the set of all records isn't actually stored on Ethereum anymore? So the idea here would be that the uh, the ENS registry remains on Ethereum, and uh, any owner of an ENS name can point the uh, basically point the record at an L2 effectively, which means that resolving that name uh, or the, the 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 resolution of that name is now the responsible responsibility of that L2. Any subdomains are now managed by that L2 and so forth. Um, and the idea behind this. A tester based system is that if I want to say resolve an arbitrary name, then what I do instead of resolving it directly on Ethereum is I find an attester for the L2 it's committed to and say, please provide me a signature proving that this L2 would resolve this name to, to this address. And this also works for cross L2 support, in that, you know, if, I, if I'm working with another L2 and I want to resolve a name that's uh, that's set up on a different one, then I can, I can ask that same attester for a proof. And they're bonded on L1. I see. Um, so the idea, for instance, would be that uh, maybe, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say MetaMask wants to offer subdomains to its users, but doesn't want to uh, uh, emit a transaction for every user on L Ethereum L1, therefore consuming resources. They assign it to their issuer, con their, their registrar contract on, say, Optimism and then issue people subdomains on optimism, but now resolving those names requires uh, proving what they what they equal on optimism. I see. So is 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 is, is this is it, I'm just wondering if this is if what I'm about to say is in scope for this discussion or just something that sounds like not a little bit out of scope, which, which is instead of having um, like creating uh, like subdomains for layer two on the ENS, um, what will be quite interesting, I think, uh, for, for quite well. For our later, I imagine this, this is not just unique to us, but would be to register domains on uh, to, to register domains on, on L1 directly on ENS and have layer two um, rollups be able to directly read that state out um, by, for example, uh, like for example, if if the if, if the ENS registry was a um, Shanti like this Merkle tree. Then, um, by querying the ENS contract for the root of that, of that market tree, you could then in your rollup, you could then be able to trustlessly um, call out um, domains for, from ENS. Yeah. And that would be extremely useful because it, um, for, for being able to you know, send transactions to actual um, users instead of uh, abstract addresses. Um, so, one problem. One problem with that is that even if it were a Merkle tree, in order to prove that a root is the current root of the ENS Merkle tree, you would need basically an Ethereum like client to prove that that is what's committed to in the chain, at which point you could probably just, you know, query the contract directly. 
Um, the other issue is that ENS has a degree of sort of expandability beyond being just a, a list of names to addresses and that people can have older contracts that can implement arbitrary logic. So you'd be significantly reducing the versatility of ENS if you reduced it to you now have to have a static list because that's all we can support with, with lookups. Yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I'm wondering if there's a possible like translation there that can apply that kind of creates a subset of EMS that just has those lookups because um I mean that's the, extremely useful. Yeah, the, the proposal by Vitalik, for instance, would require some restriction of, of the capabilities uh, on L2s in that um, whatever the resolver logic on L2 is has to be verifiable on L1, and that may put constraints on a particular attester's support for, you know, dynamic resolvers and so forth. Um, so I think we're willing to entertain uh, a, a degree of of loss of versatility in return for, for resolving well on all these platforms, but I think it needs to be something that isn't uh, that, that is adjustable by by individuals, so they can you know they can commit to a scheme, their name to a scheme that does you know some particular system, um, and therefore you know limits them to this sort of resolver. Um, but somebody else could write a better system without us having to redeploy all of ENS, um, which is what we would have to do if we were you know encoding uh, Merkle hashes of the entire tree of name resolutions, for instance. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Kind of very, very relevant, but kind of in the opposite direction. I think that's kind of the, the in terms of kind of notifying the layer one and, and kind of end users of, of the state of, of names in the layer two, um, publishing a route from layer two back to layer one of all the names, I think is the other kind of major point in the design space, which would still use the testers uh, for optimistic rollups to get around the, 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 the um, challenge delay. Um, but where essentially the, the, you wouldn't have to, for instance, kind of, you would have, you, it would be a much simpler system in that you would just have the attester commit to a single value um, yep. and just kind of always publish that value rather than kind of, and, and not actually, and kind of need to operate on challenge much less, um, if mm -hmm. at all. Um, I think it, it could actually, I think, it, I think it would actually be possible to make a system that didn't even require, um, challenges um, in any way where, where the attester would just automatically be slashed if the rollup published a value different from what they uh, had claimed to. Yep. Um, so they that, published Merkle, Merkle proofs to, for the, for the lookups uh, specifically. Yeah. So in that version of things, ENS becomes a deployment of some particular, you know, rollup uh, that exists to support ENS and all of the records and all of the resolvers and so forth live on that. And just like any other rollup, its its state is periodically published to L1 so that resolvers can resolve it. I guess the uh, the downside of this is that it requires uh, well, there's a couple of things. One is it, there's that trade-off between when do you pick a solution and commit to it, and therefore you know ENS is now on this platform. And if it turns out that that was vastly inferior to something that came along later, then all sorts of trouble. Um, and the other is that it makes all these other platforms effectively sort of second class citizens when it comes to resolving. Although if it's its own deployment, then even other deployments of the same uh, roll up, you know, are effectively second class citizens. And maybe that's just what the world looks like in the future, because lots of things are going to have their own deployments and cross chain cross roll up communication is going to have to be the norm. So, so that's actually not what I was proposing. I was proposing kind of roughly speaking, there being a, a canonical format that any rollup could implement um, that would publish the state, the records um, of all of the names that have been designated to that rollup. Um, so uh -huh. you, it would kind of lock into a kind of, cano let's say a canonical Merkle tree format that would represent kind of the current state of all names um, that are being resolved by that rollup, but anyone could implement it. Yeah, so uh, I guess, in that situation, do the does the roll-up infrastructure itself have to support this, or can you implement this as a third party on top of the roll-up? Because one nice thing about Vitalik's proposal was that anyone can implement a contract that interfaces between the two. It's not intrinsic to the infrastructure of the roll-up. Um, but we're already to some degree intrinsic to the roll-up. Well, at least... 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely is a little less general. Um, no matter what, you need some way to prove fraud, which is already specific to the roll-up. Um, yeah, so so in the but in the in the attester challenge system, um, I could write a an attest. Uh, I'm sorry, I could write a contract that handles commitment of names to optimism, and you could write one as well, and they could be different and have different functionality, and neither of them required a change to optimism. Um, just you know, the, the the person committing the name understood the parameters they were doing it under. Um, I'm wondering if what you're proposing where there's a canonical Merkel root, um, whether that requires uh, it be in the same sort of trust boundary as, um, you know, as the, the roll up itself, um, or if a random person could do it, and if so, how you'd know that that was the correct route. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could generalize it a little bit by kind of having the attester specify, I mean, for, for general EVM roll ups, you could have the attester specify kind of some contract on L2 that would publish records that it would, uh, you know, that it would attest to um, and, you know, uh, have some form of kind of, uh, of, of validity proof based on that route as to kind of a given, a given name had a given value. So you could generalize it a little bit, um, but, it, but it certainly would be, it'd be less general, but I think it'd be easier to implement and more efficient um, because, like I said, not needing to actually have the the fraud gossip network would be pretty cool yeah well i guess uh i mean you could you could structure it a similar way in that anyone can can write a an l2 interface contract and each l2 interface contract has to publish its own merkle yeah. route um and the person committed who committed their name to that accepted the parameters of that when they when they did yeah. it um i think the main also, thing is the dynamic the, the dynamicism that you were just talking about earlier is the reason not to do this at the L1. So that's not necessarily the case because one's, one thing I've mooted before is as long as you're happy to deploy a resolver contract to L1, you can do this nice trick where what you do is the data that's committed to in the Merkle tree is a blob of call data uh, and a resolver address. And when you want to resolve the name, what you do is you look up its blob and its resolver address and then in a local environment, you instantiate a, a fork of that resolver, you call it with the blob, and then you call it again with a, a read call to say what is the resolution of this. And basically the blob is what it was needed to configure that resolver to resolve that name. And you don't have to care what the data is because that's entirely between the, the resolver and its user. Um, all you have to do is call it and then check again and get the result. Um, so you don't even have to standardize the interface for setting data. Um, and that lets you keep the dynamism as long as each resolver contract has a matching, you know, matching functionality on L1, which I don't think is a particularly steep requirement because most people will use the public resolver and those that don't will probably just deploy it once and they don't actually need to update data in that resolver that just needs to be available to call. So this seems, this seems like it has potential to me. You still need... As, I mean, as you say, you still need some sort of data availability solution, but uh, we can we can validate that the, the available data is accurate without uh, risk of, of fraud as long as it's already been committed. It doesn't sound like you necessarily need a data availability solution in the context we're talking about, because we're talking about essentially um, the, the attester has to, I mean, anyone who is a client of that rollup will have the would have the data the the data available, and we're talking about essentially the ability to to validate uh, messages from the attester, and the attester is carrying a proof with them. Yep. So that's that's kind of what I meant was more yeah. that uh, oh, cool. you need so uh, a resolving client needs a way to find and contact someone who uh, has accumulated all the data that that they can construct a Merkle proof from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then they they give it to you, and if it's from a a recent block that's already passed its challenge period, you just automatically know it's accurate. Um, and if it's still during the challenge period, then they need to be bonded. And if they're stupid enough to lie, then you yourself can prove them wrong in an hour or something. Um, and you know, maybe uh, you know, if you you aren't sure that your client's going to stick around for an hour, you can have a service where you basically you send them a copy of every resolution you do. And if they find some fraud, they give you a chunk of the, the deposit and you know in return for them sticking around long enough to check. 
Yeah, and I, I think you could even make it so that the the proving of fraud would be fully automatic. Um, that the when the rollup block commits, it, it synchronously makes sends the root to some contract um, that would trigger the slashing of the attester uh, potentially, um, which we need well, to simplify it a little bit more. Yeah, you only know fraud happened if the um, uh, if you know what the resolutions, the signed messages were, and those won't typically be on chain. Ah, no, but the signed messages are pro are are, um, are proofs against the Merkle root. So the Merkle root is on chain um, yes. and published periodically. And, and so you don't even need to sign anything beyond that. Um, you just need a Merkle uh, proof. Right. But in order to know proof fraud happened, you need somebody needs to submit a signature by one of the attesters for a fraudulent Merkle root. Um, you can't automatically detect that they signed a, a fraudulent one. Yeah. Oh, I guess I was imagining in this scheme um, something with a little more on-chain interaction where the attester would actually publish uh, transactions to kind of update their current route uh, periodically. I, if you didn't want to require that publishing, then you would need someone to... to um, yeah. Well, the nice thing about not requiring the publishing is you don't have the delay. Um, you know, you can, you can resolve immediately from yeah. latest data. Um, although, you know, I, I would make the argument that potentially... Uh, a delay even of a few hours, like I don't know what a typical challenge period is for some of these L2s, but a delay of an hour or two may well be acceptable. Like we put up with it all the time in DNS, um, you know, that, you know, your name will take a little bit, a little while when you change the resolution of it. Uh, just sorry for interrupting. Uh, it's about 12 minutes left. And do you want to carry on this conversation or do you want to touch upon other topics? Especially, I think now there's a call from Optimism is online. So we could diverse conversation a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we can dig into this a lot, in a lot more detail later. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what people other than the two of us have to say about it, whether you've, you've picked up any insights and so forth. And then we can talk a little bit about like, how we can continue this conversation to, to actually building a solution. So I actually have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, it sounds like y'all are talking about building a roll-up specific for ENS, or is this... Um, uh, yeah, what, 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 like, as you were talking all about, uh, you know, posting these, these proofs and these challenges, and you were saying, do we post the data? And that sounds like a kind of a plasma solution. Um, so is that, is this, because I think it's actually very reasonable. In fact, ENS on a plasma, like, is actually a pretty reasonable um, thing to, to build, um, especially because ENS can be like very lightweight. And, you know, you can like design it specifically so it's easy to verify in the browser and, you know, you can just like do a lot of fun stuff. Um, is that kind of the direction that y'all were talking about? Uh, so that was what I initially thought was being said, but it's, it's actually slightly different. The idea is that uh, you can use existing rollups, uh, a contract on them can post a, a Merkle root of ENS specific state to a contract on L1 by using, you know, whatever the rod, whatever the L2's sort of push to L1 functionality yes. is. Um, and then resolvers can use that state directly. So it, it meets sort of the definitions of a rollup, but you don't have to run your own rollup network. You can mm -hmm. interact this from any L2 of your choice, you and, and it, it benefits from all of the infrastructure they've already built. Is that a fair description? Yeah. Uh, that, okay. That sounds that sounds good. Uh, one like interesting note about that is um, so that would be is that is it fair to say like it, that's a general purpose roll up that happens to be the um, kind of the driver of ENS registrations and pushing these state routes. Because it does sound like, it does sound somewhat similar to having a special purpose roll up for ENS, if you know, you know what I mean? Um, the difference here is that each name owner could commit their name to a specific L2 and then that, would, that name and all the names under it would have a, a Merkle root. Um, so the base yes. registries 
exists on L1 and then just subtrees on each on each L2. Similar Beautiful. to the Talix suggestion, but with uh, you know proactive rather than reactive, I guess. Nice. Yeah, I, lo I I'm a big fan of that solution. Yeah, some like very like small top level domain for all of these different rollups, and then each one can have their own subdomains. And yeah, perfect. I, I'm a big fan. One downside of this that's worth noting is that it scales with the number of subdomains you create, basically. Like, uh, you have to publish a Merkle root. If you commit your one name to it, then you still have to publish a Merkle root update for every update to that name. Um, so it doesn't work so well for you if, I mean, well, so that's, yeah, you could have a, you could have a setup where you commit a dozen second level .eth names and you only have to publish one update for all of those. Um, but if you commit, if you write your own solution and commit only your name to it, you don't really save anything. You only save stuff insofar as multiple people use it. Um, you still have to commit that one word of one word every update. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that seems fine. Yeah, I think I think that's reasonable in that just like the public resolver, most people will use the same thing. Um, it's worth thinking though about the the trade off between latency and, and efficiency. Uh, you know, if most names are only updated rarely, even if there's a thousand names on a particular roll up, if you make a change, you might be only be the only person making a change in a one hour window, and therefore you pay the full cost. I see. Yeah. And, and also generally having the latency for these, you know, if, if, if most resolution is happening just through L1. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it kind of sucks to not be able to like resolve immediately. Um, you know, once you've registered on an L2, you know, being able to go to whatever your subdomain is, uh, well, that's kind of, that's kind of dumb, you know, sad. That is where the attesters can potentially come in and they can say, I am I am staking my bond on the fact that this will be a future Merkle route. Um, which yeah. complicates a little, but gives does give you that. And, and then that gives the the clients more flexibility in saying, yeah, I am okay with waiting a day or something for, for other updates to accumulate to save on costs. Yeah. It does sound like something that could be something that could be handled in the layer two in question. As, as you said, like if they want to tolerate, if they if, if they use if they if they want to support a low latency, then you, you kind of the layer the layer two can have its own internal management of pending yes. updates that is going to push to to, to ENS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then if the if we did something with the the bonding and the attesters, which is very low risk, uh, you know, for the attesters because they they are you know aware of the future state of the system. Um, then you could potentially very much relieve the requirements for uh, for you know low latency um, because you don't really care that it hasn't been published to Ethereum yet um, because you know that it will be. To to reduce the potential bond of the attesters, can I um, set? trusted attesters in my text records or something and only be able to resolve with certain attesters that I trust. Say there's like a federation of five companies that run attestation nodes. Can I specify I only want them uh, and thus like reduce the bond size that could be problematic? Yep, I, I can see pros and cons to that. My reservation is that, that uh, the ultimate end point of that is something where basically you're just using an HTTP server to resolve your name and, uh, you know, relying on someone else to tell you about it, you know, your bond is zero. Um, and the, the advantage of that system is it's very simple. The disadvantage is it's, it's uh, effectively equivalent to like storing your coins on an exchange. You know, you're entirely reliant on their security and, and competency. Um, but we can, I mean, we can allow people to make that trade off. The problem with exposing levers like that to people is that they um, they mostly don't care about them and they don't want to interact with them. They just want name resolution to work, you know. Um, but I guess, you know, once again, if, if you have a 100% chance of being caught as an attester, if you're fraudulent, then you, you really have to know that you're going to make more of your fraudulent activity than you do much simpler game. I'm guessing these are tested contracts as well, like the, the, the interface will be well defined, but the implementation will be up to the 
roll up and question. Um, because for like for, for ZK roll up, um, yeah, as long as you have on chain data availability, then then obviously you can uh, you can trustlessly uh, prove the correctness of the state updates we're going to be posting to DNS. So we get yeah. to uh, yeah, just be able to connect to that interface in a in a, in a convenient you know, in such a manner. Yeah. Um, so we're, as I'm sure Makoto was just about to say, we're just about out of time. Um, I will write up what we discussed today, in particular focus on the, the medical root approach as a variation of, you know, a, a, of how to do it and its pros and cons. Um, I, I would love to make this effort to build an ENS resolution on L2 a sort of a working group type thing, not just, you know, okay, now the ENS team is going to go off and do this on their own and come back and here's our wonderful solution, but to actually work together to build a standard. So, um, you know, I'll, po I'll post this to the list. Um, I'll get uh, Makoto to send it out to all of you. Um, if you're interested in pursuing this further, I would love it if you guys would, would join and help sort of flesh out a standard and we'll probably need another uh, you know, call or two like this to explore the parameters a bit, bit more, but then we can actually start talking about, you know, how, how to actually build this. Uh, about the time-wise, is this the best time or is it, like, it, is it better to be earlier or later? Like, Carl, are you based in Asia or somewhere? No, um, I am not. Um... I, I know some folks are, but it's a fine time for me. Okay, because uh, we scheduled this time because Vitalik, I thought he's based in Singapore and he said he, he can't wake up at six. But if yeah. that's not a constraint, we can even make it earlier because we dropped some of the European participant because it's quite late, like uh, London 11, but I think uh, France it's 12 midnight. Would, would that be probably if we do a bit earlier or? Well, it's good for me. me. Okay. Well, we can discuss timing, I think, later. But okay. Yeah, we can we can put together a doodle for people who are, are willing to you know continue this further. Okay. Uh, any last notes from anyone? Uh, just one question about the user uh, kind of user experience point of view. So because it goes to assuming we don't move the entire dot e east domain to specific L2, it's going to be the kind of, for example, Ethereum or mostly like wallet provider who kind of issue their own subdomain, they can go their entire domain into specific L2. So they can issue subdomain almost like without not much gas, but yep. that name is available pretty much everywhere, right? So like we are seeing the point like now uh, that like, you know, Second level domain like you know Nick dot East or Makoto dot East will be very very premium experience because it's so expensive to manage keep managing in L one. So we and, transition to the subdomain centric. Uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, like as a as an end user who wanted to register a domain to say host your website that's updated every day, you might register it and immediately commit it like in the same transaction to a particular L two, so that all your content updates can go there. Um, and therefore you can you can save on fees. So I think in this vision, uh, registering and renewing a .eth domain will always be an L1 operation, um, but everything after that, you could easily commit to a, an L2 solution. Oh, okay, interesting. Cool. Great, well, thank you everyone. I think it was really productive. I'm, I'm pleased that we, we sort of managed to, to move things forward. Cool, and I'll upload it, I'll process it and upload to YouTube and then, yeah, we can share. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thanks guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks guys. Cheers.